On the 31st of March 1970, Seki Gunha, also known as the Red Army Faction, astonished the nation. A Japan airline Boeing 727, Flight 351, nicknamed the Yoda Go, was heading from Tokyo to Fukuoka. It was carrying 131 passengers and a crew of seven. Among those on board were nine members of the Seki Gun, led by tactician Takamaro Tamiya, just 27 years old. It was a short flight and the radicals were not planning to waste time. As the plane was cruising over Mount Fuji, they made their move. In their hand luggage they had brought a small tube-like case of the kind used normally to transport tents and fishing rods. From these they produced weapons and shouted at the passengers to raise their hands. They charged the cockpit. The pilots were hardened veterans of the wartime air force. Nonetheless, this was Japan's first ever airplane hijacking and they were wary of resisting. The plane was to be flown to North Korea, but this is where things start to get awry. Though the underground sekigang were practiced to the point of precisely rehearsing the hijacking by hiring a large meeting room, they had missed a key element. There was not enough fuel to reach Pyongyang, so the plane was forced to land in Fukuoka, refuel and then fly to North Korea. The hijackers had prepared well and brought 200 pieces of rope and cord to tie up the passengers, though they spared the women and children. The press had gathered in force. By the time they arrived, the hijackers let some passengers go as a sign of good faith and escorted by Japanese SDF jets, the JLL craft flew towards Korea. However, at their destination, it became apparent that a deception had been performed. The airstrip where they landed was not Pyongyang, but Kimbo, near Seoul. The hijackers still had around 100 crew and passengers in their custody, which they were threatening to blow up. A standoff inevitably began with the Yoga Go not budging from the runway. A compromise was finally reached on April 3rd, after much turmoil. The details of the plan were agreed. The hostages were released that evening after an ordeal of 79 hours. The Yodago flew onto the real Pyongyang. Leader Tamiya penned the departure declaration, the final lines which have become very famous. We carry through to the end of this historic mission given to us. Brothers and sisters of Japan, comrades of the proletariat, early staged armed uprising, world revolution bonsai, Seki Gunha, bonsai, finally to confirm we are Ashton Mojo. So what's going on here? There's a lot to unpack. Let's start with who is Ashton no Joe? I finally found you, Joe. The guy I've been looking for all these years. With your speed and your strength and your instincts, you're a cross between a wild animal and poetry in motion. But you'll never be a boxer without training, and that's why I'm here, Joe. I'm here to change you from a wild animal to the greatest boxer in the world. Ashton Ojo was one of the most popular sports manga of all time, especially among the new left. Its serialization was in tangent with the student protest movement. Joe was seen as the man of the people, a representative of the working class. He certainly wasn't a bunch of elite college students that couldn't even spell the name right. But in their defense, Ashton Ojo was a very popular manga and TV show. In fact, it ranked fourth not so long ago in a celebrity poll. But when it came to getting their message across that they were the everyman struggling to that general public, that did not work one bit. In fact, they came off as a bunch of kids instead of revolutionaries. One of those boys came from Doshisha University in Kyoto. Moriaki Wakabayashi, a bassist for a band known as La Rallies de Nudi. The band themselves were no stranger to politics as they were part of the underground music scene, and their leader, Takahashi Mizutani, was alleged to be part of the protest movement himself. There is an air of mystery that surrounds the band, down to them having barely any interviews, if any at all, to the attire of their main lead being nothing but black and sunglasses at all times. They rarely recorded in the studio, don't expect an album which isn't live with the sound quality of a wood chipper, and it's questionable between these releases is what is official or not. Speaking of which, one of their biggest performances at the Sunglow Festival took place at a ski resort just before a typhoon. They were bursting the sound barrier so hard that the legend says that the organisers were fearful of an avalanche and insisted they turn down the music. Mizutani refused and the crowd evacuated in a frenzy as the band stood in defiance of the elements. It all sounds kind of mythic 
In fact, even the name of the band is some kind of puzzle. Le Rallye de Nudi isn't even like a French term, like rallies isn't French. So that would translate to something like the Naked Rallies. And your guess is as good as mine what that means. I mean, I've heard it might be some sort of French slang, but I don't know if I believe it. These kind of stories are the ones that music journalists love the most. I mean, the longer an old rock band comes to be, the more the curtain is pulled back in ungraceful ways. It seems like the rallies are trying the hardest they can to sell out the least of any band ever. And that's created a sort of like cult following with them. The kind of cult following that leads to a French director to travel halfway around the world just to record your band in a documentary. And when you watch that documentary and you come out the other side, you realize you know less about the band than when you began. Moreover, to top it off, in 1996, the band broke up, basically to never be seen again, out of a few exceptions but none of that would mean a damn thing if the music wasn't any good. And while I've jabbed at the audio quality here and there, I actually think that the rough production is to the band's benefit. If you were to take nails on a chalkboard and put it for an amp, you wouldn't get a sound that is as harsh as this one. And I mean that in a good way. The noise levels are an experience. To be submerged into a feedback loop, which is dipped in acid, and then Jesus, the heavy and guttural delay eats away at the songs, eroding them at their core. These set lists become like a collection of old friends, popping back in and over and over again. Adjusting with the times for sure, but just as you remember them. Over the years, the band become proficient in their favourite numbers. It's like the hits of an album they never released. And that involves tracks like The Last One, which is an absolute mammoth you can see a ghost appear through the mist with this fractal, broken voice. Buzz saws of guitar tones, a bass tone that holds up the noise chasm, a gigantic wall of sound where the melody has to crawl its way through to get to the surface, blaring itself out after 20 minutes. Then the sound begins to just evaporate. Night of the Assassins is one of the more wild tracks, because not only is it one of the catchiest, it actually takes its origins from a much more mellow area. <laughs> Little Peggy Marsh's 1967's I Will Follow Him. And it turns the bass line of that track into something devastating. The band wasn't above it catchiness as well, it's the marriage between those worlds that make them so compelling. On the other side we have White Awakening, which is almost like the aftermath of all that noise explosions, it has a mellowness in its melancholy, and with its catchy sort of riffs, it feels like it would be at home in the 80s garage era, I mean pixies eat your heart out. It's proto-noise rock on the precipice of shoegaze but 20 years too early. Certainly it has folk origins but they are just distorted to hell. And when you compare it to the stuff that came out 50 years ago, especially when you see it in its live performance era, you really get a feeling for which one of them is stuck within a sort of sound and who's really broken through. When I first heard of rallies, they kind of reminded me of that Velvet Underground story you always hear, that like the band themselves only sold like a thousand units, but each person that bought a record started their own band. If we're talking about any of their albums that are pretty close to it, it would probably be White Light, White Heat, especially with its rawness. In fact, in Julian Cope's book, he recounts some of Mizutani's early origins, including how the Velvet Underground's second LP, White Light, White Heat, was a big inspiration for him. He was already a fan of Lou Reed's early work and its criticism of the American flower power movement. Mizutani was so overwhelmed by the 17-minute brain death 
of Sister Ray and the freeform chaos of I Heard Her Call My Name that indefinitely inspired the band as a whole. At the time, he was only 19 years old at university. That degree was in sociology and French literature. The young Muzutani was a typical post-war Japanese intellectual who had rejected all pervasive American pop culture and the love of other older black-clad existentialists who smoked French cigarettes. He read French-language copies of Jean-Paul Sarchi or Jacques Derrida. In November 67, he formed his own folk band with four like-minded individuals, including the bassist, Wakabayashi. For their shows, strobes and mirror balls throughout the while others danced in front of the stage. He was deciding on a multimedia approach, which was this way forward. The new term would be total sensory assault, becoming his modus operandi, certainly for his early shows, which took posters that said stuff like, for those young people, including you, who live in this modern, agonizing adolescence, who are wanting a true radical music, I sincerely wish dialogue accompanied by the piercing pain will be born and fill this recital hall that is the epitome of edge, it almost sounds, um, unreal. Although following the hijacking, the other members of the rallies disappeared from sight and Mizutani found himself pursued by the Japanese federal agents who never arrested him but observed from afar. However, the presence of US nationals aboard the Yodo Go inevitably brought the CIA to Japan and these gentlemen were far from casual with their observations. Finally, the rally's leader went into hiding, moving into his friend's Tokyo apartment, and talked on embarking a solo career or reforming the rallies as an acoustic band. But his mind was fried from the hijack fallout. For most of 1971, Mizutani remained holed up in his Tokyo apartment, venturing out only to buy milk and other essentials. Paranoid and deluded, it really wasn't his year. As the 70s went on though, there was a new potential for extreme sounding bands, as the punk movement was starting to rise. But it still would be a 10 year struggle for the band as they moved forward. It is said that in the 80s, Mizutani slipped quietly away to France, remaining there for five years to play with free sax player Arthur Doyle. And the rest we already know. Now, I gotta say, Cope's book is entertaining, but what if I were to tell you it's all probably bullshit? Yeah, I mean, I know, I know. The citations on it are pretty weak, and when you compare it to like the writings of people like Ian Martin, who wrote Quit Your Band, well, it's just that a lot of it isn't true. If you talk to anyone who had actual first-hand knowledge of the 70s underground, it's widely understood that he just flat out made up a lot of it. I remember speaking to Damo Suzuki about him once, and he said something along the lines of that Julian Cope often writes things that aren't strictly true, but maybe they are true in their own personal cosmos. Now, to be fair, few have actually got to the truth in the matter. When you look at stuff like Red Bull Academy's article in search for Le Rallye's Denudi, it mentions the real reason Muzutani was so distant was up in the air. Some attribute it to his long-lasting paranoia, or a sort of Wakabayashi's continued wanton status. Others say it's simply a way to conjure mystery, to attract a lure. In any event, very few people seem to know where he is now, or what he's doing, or he's going, or if he's ever going to return to the stage. But that's a style, to appear out of the blue at a sound check for a show, but not the show. That way people will hear he was there. It sounds like it's all mystique, like his absolute obsession with getting people to contact him only by fax. His last public appearance happened in 1997 for a collab release, where he played with saxist Arthur Doyle next to a couple of members of Denudis. <laughs> recalls that Mizutani didn't say too much. I didn't contact him myself. Jun Tananaka booked us the place for two or three nights, 200 people showed up, and Mizutani was a strange kind of character. He just wanted to play music. From that account, it doesn't even sound like Doyle had even met Mizutani beforehand, which puts uh, Cope's writing in even more damning descent. The ambiguity of it all just makes it more alluring to those writers who just stack more and more on it by the day. It's that vapid rock and roll edge to it all, you know, that they're kind of dangerous. Well, the bass player hijacked a plane to North Korea, and these guys really rock. Your mind can fill in the blanks in really interesting ways. That's what everyone else has done. Legend has it that Mizutani was also offered a role in the hijacking, but refused. But that one of their founding members was so, so radical and did something so crazy. Well, the reality of it isn't as graceful, of course. The Red Army faction, nicknamed the Buns Bastards, were removed from the Bund's protest group because of their admission of urban guerrilla warfare. But really, most of the people in the protests were enamored with the Vietnam War situation. They were really uncomfortable with the state that 
B-52s from America would refuel in Japan's ports and then go on to bomb Vietnam to ashes in a similar way that happened in World War II to Japan. Yet planning to hijack a plane so you can go to North Korea to then fuel up to go to Cuba to learn to become a revolutionary and then to come all the way back to Japan just to take it over, as you do on a Sunday afternoon, seems a little bit short-sighted to be, uh, to say the least, let's, let, let's go with that. Moreover, the hijackers' weapons were fake and a lot of the passengers that were hostages said that generally the, the hijackers treated them really well. Like they were better than the hostess. And we know the nine of them weren't exactly super soldiers, but some of them were as young as 16. When they arrived at North Korea, obviously they didn't leave. They got absorbed into the state and became spies for them, never to leave their little cages to see any kind of freedom again. The bassist Wakabayashi actually did an interview in 2010 for Kyodo News. And what he basically said was that he found a regret in his actions of youth. He found it was conceited and selfish of him. And that if he could, he'd gladly take trial to go back to Japan, even if it meant that he had to go to jail. As of 2017, only four members are left alive in North Korea. One of them being Wakabayashi. That year, he was interviewed by Japanese BuzzFeed. Now, if you can read it, there seems to be a lot of, you know, unique information in there about his experiences during the early days of the band and his love for baby Mel, as you do. Well, yeah, the reputation of a hijacking mix for a great YouTube video topic, it doesn't do the band any good, as the government started cracking down on anything that was even remotely left-wing, which pretty much destroyed the underground music scene. But the final nail in the coffin for the new left was actually in 1973 with the untitled Red Army's capture. Um, in the spring of 72, the police caught up with him at, uh, in Karuizawa, of all places, and they had a 10-day siege at a mountain resort called Asama Sanso. You may have heard of that. After the siege ended with nobody hurt and everybody arrested, um, it turned out that while they'd been in the mountains over the winter, they had had a horrible internal purge and they had killed 14 of their own members, not just killed, tortured and killed. So it was devastating and it was a real death blow to what was left of the radical new left. After that, um, people couldn't hold their heads up. And Jesus Christ, talk about bad optics. I mean, yeah, you've got to be careful of that sort of stuff. Well, on a lighter note, the noisy sound of rallies actually followed through in the next generation of underground music. And while, yeah, the band themselves aren't going to come back anytime soon, it's never been easier to listen to them, if that be on the internet, on YouTube, or even buying their records. The internet age has done wonders for their bootleg reputation. Now, if we're talking about recommendations, people tend to like the Live 77 record, or heavier than the death of a family, which is an excellent title if I say so myself. But to me, it's not really about which one you choose. It's more about the experience of laying down and just letting the music take you over, like the sonic frisson just blasts through your body until you're nothing but a puddle on the floor. <laughs> All right, well, here we go. It's that time again. My cat would like to thank all, all of my patrons for helping out support the show. She's really loud. <laughs> so that's Alex Moriarty, Joven, that Puerto Rican guy, and Daniel Strait. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, she, I think she ran away. Okay, I guess she doesn't. All right, she's done. She's did a, she did a patron intro, and that's all, that's all you're going to get, I'm afraid. Sorry, she's been a bit stingy today. Right, so that's cool. If you, if you like the show, you can support it. We have a ton of extras that come on the Patreon. If you want to keep seeing, there's a couple of... She's still going. There's a couple of, like, uh, goals to go on to. You know, it's, it's, it's wild. If you'd like to see more Japanese music videos, we've got um, a whole list probably here of ones I've done. Uh, Pad Channington was supposed to be in this video, but some complications happened, and unfortunately that didn't, that didn't get to be... He also has his own series on Japanese music, which... Uh, you know, it's worth checking out. If you got this far, you might as well like, subscribe, and ring the bell, because who knows what my schedule's gonna be like, and, you know, you probably love me, so do that stuff. Makes, makes the world a difference. Mwah.